And I do want to ask you about the ADA um, as we talk about issues down the road, but I want to stick with the uh, Congressional Black Caucus for the moment. First, I just want to pick up on something you said here, which is blunders as well. What would you say was, was one of the blunders uh, that's, that stands out? Well, one continuing blunder is that the plan. We don't spend enough time developing legislation uh, which addresses the needs of that large number of people out there in the black community who are still poor. Uh, working families, at least half the black community, because it's poor across the country, and that's not exaggerating. Then the working families are just a few paychecks away from poverty. Uh, we have not collectively developed a plan, uh, and a set of le uh, pieces of legislation which have been able to deal with that in an ongoing way. We lost, the biggest blunder was we lost the Community Action Program and the Office of Economic Opportunity. We allowed Nixon to make inroads into it, but we did, he didn't finish it off. We let Reagan finish it off. And the history of the caucus, and I, because I came out of the Community Action Program, I was a commissioner on the Lindsay, I was very concerned when I got here about what had happened. And the history of the caucus is they just ignored they ignored it, the importance of it, they never understood it, never supported it. That's the biggest blunder. They didn't have, they had a foothold in government addressing the needs of the people uh, who we represent uh, in all of our districts. The majority of people are poor, and we let that get away. The second blunder relates to that, and that is under a Democratic president, Clinton, we allowed the Welfare Reform Act to pass. And I'm in the minority on this. Most people think that's a great act, but I think it was a horror. Uh, the Welfare Reform Act uh, was supposed to have a, an aggressive uh, initiative for job training and job creation. At the same time they were passing it, they were cutting programs for jobs, and the Secretary of Labor under, under Clinton resigned, actually, because his, his, his uh, department was being uh, sort of uh, uh, reduced so drastically. Uh, we let that happen probably couldn't have prevented it because it was a combination of Gingrich and the president. It was much worse than it should have been. Uh, they could have had welfare reform along the lines of the president, but he let the Gingrich people push him. Even Gingrich publicly said, I was surprised at how much we got away with. At the same time we were allowing that to happen, the real welfare scandal we were not touching, and that is the, the agribusiness. Welfare that goes to farmers is, is, is outrageous. And uh, if you want it to be a champion of personal responsibility, then it's the agri-corporations that we ought to be talking to because farmers are less than 1% of the population, and yet they take $32, $40 billion out of the budget on a regular basis, and then later on they get drought relief money to add to that and hurricane relief money to add to that. You know, and uh, the real rip-off in, in government, if you're concerned about waste, look at the pattern of subsidies for, for the agri-corporations. They're not, they're not individuals anymore. When Roosevelt developed the subsidy program, a little check was going to a dirt farmer out there to help him uh, improve and cooperate with the local agricultural county agent and so forth, encourage that. Uh, that later on became a quota. Each farmer had, a, he had his quota. They sold them to the corporations, and now you have big agricultural corporations that have those subsidies, and they're getting paid I think we tried to pass a bill with the maximized amount of payment they can use at $265,000. That was defeated. It was too little. The agri-business uh, lobby uh, uh, caucus, which is the blue dogs mainly. The blue dogs are primarily the great uh, promoters of the agribusiness subsidy, and they're the ones who hate the welfare. They, they tech welfare recipients the most. It is one of those things that, that I intend to p deal with a great length in my book. Uh, and we allow them to get away with it, and we allow ourselves to lose any kind of uh, foothold in the government to help really poor people on an ongoing basis. Uh, you were talking about agriculture, and that brings me to another question, which is the composition of the Congressional Black Caucus has changed during the time that you were in Congress. Uh, it was dominated by African Americans from big cities in America, and increasingly the members have come from the South where they often have to deal with rural issues as well as your members, other members dealing with the big city issues. How has that changed 
the cohesiveness and effectiveness and working relationship inside the Black Caucus. Well, it has had quite an impact uh, on the uh, caucus. We are more diverse uh, in terms of interest at this point. Uh, it, it is a real danger. Uh, there's a danger of some kind of balkanization, if not careful. And it's to the credit of most of the members that they have not uh, had any uh, public splitting on certain, uh, on certain issues. We all agree that education is a priority. Education for the big cities, inner cities, and education for the neglected rural schools. That we, we, we're solidly together on that. When you look at the Congressional Black Caucus alternative budget, which for several years I was in charge of preparing, uh, I ran into great opposition when 13 members came in from the South uh, because of my attacks on the agri-business and the agri-budget and the subsidies. Uh, uh, they, they saw that as being against their constituents' interests, although when challenged, they, they, they agreed that the money is not flowing to their constituents, it's going to big agri-corporations, but that's still a point of contention. I, don't, I didn't do the budget for the last couple of years, and I noticed that they didn't touch the subsidies <laughs> for agriculture in proposing cuts. Uh, the, the defense industry is, is big in a couple of uh, districts, and uh, they uh, are not as comfortable with their margin of, of uh, victory as some of the big city uh, members like myself and some others, uh, so they have to worry about uh, a big military base that happens to be their uh, big military factory, another place, and so th that that does make for some 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 tensions. And then there is a there is a class problem, I think, in terms of the orientation of some toward uh, the answer for the black community is uh, a larger entrepreneurial class, more businesses, uh, and uh, a greater emphasis on. Uh, on the private sector, uh, assisting, et cetera, all of which is true, but those who put that forward and propose it most forcefully want to neglect and omit the kind of disaster we face as was exposed in Katrina. There are pockets of poor blacks, as poor as the people in the Ninth Ward, uh, who are in danger of just not being able to survive. Uh, Given that crisis, they were not able to take care of themselves, and you can pinpoint all the reasons it's related to poverty. Uh, and there are a lot of those across the country in every big city. Uh, my uh, New York, by the way, New York City, had the greatest increase in poverty of any big city uh, in the last ten, uh, ten years. And uh, my district includes the epicenter of the AIDS epidemic in North America, as in part of my district. Uh, with a whole bunch of related diseases that uh, uh, are rampant there. So you, you, we, we have crises that there is a group that will come in, <laughs> uh, mostly from Yale and Harvard, <laughs> who don't uh, consider that uh, as important as it should be. So there is a, there is a tension, which we, we, I hope will be resolved in the direction of them understanding that uh, you know, no matter how you cut it, uh, at least half of the people each one represents are poor people. Well, now you've raised the other generational question, which is also a change in the caucus. So you have younger members now, and they are those who didn't live through and uh, serve on the front lines of the civil rights movement, uh, which was so much a part of the formation of the political core of most of you. How has the infusion of that new, younger generation, the one that was, came of age after the 60s, how is that affecting the Black Caucus? Well, I think the younger generation, uh, and I'm not going to call any names, so just make some sweeping statements here, uh, don't appreciate the need for group cohesion as much as the older ones do. They didn't go through the same kind of struggle. Uh, in my opinion, they are more naive about American power, American politics. Uh, they don't understand the competing forces, how greedy they can be, how rampant uh, <laughs> they can be, and 
uh, they don't quite appreciate uh, the kinds of enemies that uh, minorities and black people still have out there, systematic institutional enemies who are constantly doing things that uh, are against our interests, constantly battering away at affirmative action, uh, which has been a great success for everybody, including the American corporations, uh, but yet there are groups that still are banging away at affirmative action, uh, constantly banging away at the notion that of personal responsibility. Some of the people who cry loudest about personal responsibility are the biggest hypocrites in America. They are in the, mid the Midwestern farmers and the Southern farmers who are on the dole, they're on the payroll, of, uh, not the payroll, but they're getting more money from the federal government than anybody else. And they, they want to get government off their back. When you start looking closely, they got farm loans, they got grants for the drought and grants for the too much water, too much rain. And the market economy is sealed off. If the market is not suitable, then the subsidies go in, into effect to protect them. But they are the ones that cry loudest about uh, uh, the need to cut Medicaid and cut services for poor people, uh, refusing to fund education at a certain level because we're putting too much money in education. They want to follow the same standards they followed 50 years ago in terms of teacher salaries and uh, anti-unions and, and uh, all of this seems to escape some of our newer members in terms of what the impact of it is. And uh, they, they're naive, in my opinion. What you're also talking about, uh, in a sense, is the ideological transformation of the Democratic Party, which may be transforming itself again. But certainly, you are a self-described liberal. and. I want to ask you at some point what that means to you. But in the meantime, I want to ask you whether you think that um, the party was taken to the center by the very president who was considered to be the best friend of the Black Caucus, and that is Bill Clinton, because he did embrace um, free trade, and he did talk about personal responsibility, and he did embrace the notion of putting more police on the streets to fight crime as a higher priority uh, for Democrats than it had been before and something that appealed to Republican voters. And he did talk uh, more about uh, balanced budgets than uh, other kinds of issues and brought in the welfare reform program and so forth. So what, uh, what effect did he actually have uh, on the Democratic Party, in, in your view? He helped us to win. <laughs> we won the presidency in his first term, and he managed to win in the second time. Um, but given all that he had, Al Gore should not have had a problem if we had not fallen into the trap of not understanding Aristotle's golden mean. Everything has extremes. It, you know, I think the Clinton administration, under the push of the Democratic Leadership Council uh, went too far to the center, too far to the right, and neglected the basic constituency out there. The major blunder of the Congressional Black Caucus is also the major blunder of the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party has looked at the situation and the voting patterns over the years and turned away from the obvious. Even in a presidential election, only about 49, uh, only about 51 percent of people vote, and that other 49 percent is out there, you know. And the Democratic Party did not accept the challenge of going after that 49 percent. Organized labor has not accepted the challenge of going after that 49 percent. The Congressional Black Caucus has not accepted the challenge of going after that 49 percent. In Congressional Black Caucus districts, we still have a very low voter turnout. Following the Jesse Jackson phenomena, where we get tremendous increases, we are now drifting back. Uh, and, and why? Because those are the people who need something concrete to hold on to and say that this matters. That they did. The government is trying to help me. You know, so when Bush tried to go private with Social Security, you, you heard from them. They clearly understand that they were threatened. And uh, along with a lot of other people, the very poorest people, you know, united to push that off the agenda. Uh, but they still are out there in terms of of health care uh, in terms of mainly jobs and, and, and a means to, to make a decent living. We have not passed a minimum wage bill 
in, in nine years while Congress, you know, by cost of living increases passed by Ronald Reagan, I'm grateful for that. That's a fair thing, but uh, what Congress members get and how we treat it fairly is no reason to unfairly. I mean, it's shocking how we've been unable, and I sit on the committee and I've been the sponsor of the bill to, pay, to increase the minimum wage. We have not been able to get it up from 5015 since now. It's just ridiculous. Uh, so, and Democrats have not fallen on their sword about that. They'll say, well, we always put the amendment out there. We always try to pass the bill, and we, but we don't fall on our sword. And there, are some, there are always some negotiation things that have to take place. There are some trade-offs that even a, a Republican Party that dominates Washington has all Senate, the House, Supreme Court. They still need some help occasionally. And we could, fall, we could have fallen on our sword on the matter of the minimum wage. It's so, so key. But there's not an understanding. There's a competition for the, the suburban independents who, you know, are always the focus groups, uh, focused on them and so forth. And they forget about the fact there's a whole 49% of the people who are out of this process and somebody needs to pick up the challenge of organizing them. You know, as I go out of Congress, uh, you know, my focus, I don't intend to retire. You know, I'm going to not going to fade away. I'm going to fight from another, attack in another direction. I'm not retreating. <laughs> but one of my folks will be on forcing uh, the Democratic Party, the Congressional Caucus, to pay more attention to that tremendous resource we have out there, which is untapped. Howard Dean understands it to some degree. He talks about the state parties and so forth. But uh, underneath that is, is, a, is a grassroots organization process that. Will take place if you go reading on the strength of the state parties.